thank you all for being here for the Andrew Mitchell Center and the Center for the Advanced Study of India's joint event, Citizenship in Crisis, the Cases of India and Myanmar. Um, and thanks to our four esteemed panelists who have kindly agreed to give us the benefit of their perspective on this topic today. I'm Ishani Dasgupta, a graduate fellow at the Andrew Mitchell Center, and I'm really thrilled to be discussing this uh, discussion this morning. Uh, I mean, moderating this discussion this morning. Um, I want to also thank, um, I, I want, want to say thanks to the other AMC fellows, Katie Radar and Drew Starling, who will be helping me moderate the questions. Um, before I introduce the guests and we get into the conversation, I just wanted to pass on some logistical information. So we are going to have a 30 minutes Q&A session. And um, during the discussion, please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see um, at the bottom of your screens, um, at the bottom of your Zoom window, basically. Please also mention your name if you'd like it read out and which panelist the question is directed to. In the interest of time, I will be reading out your questions to the panelists to answer. So before I start, I'd like to give a brief introduction uh, of the topic that brings us here today. In 1982, new citizenship laws in Burma took away the de facto citizenship of its Rohingya minorities, reducing them to resident foreigners, primarily because they lack documents like birth certificates. 14 years later, the Myanmar government began a program of ethnic cleansing that has rendered over a million Rohingyas stateless. In December 2019, India passed the Citizenship Amendment Act. This was preceded by the announcement of a nationwide national register of citizens, which, is earlier in the, which had earlier in the state of Assam declared 1.9 million citizens suspect mm -hmm. and subject to scrutiny by foreigners tribunal. India, like Myanmar, has many who don't have documents. Almost 40% of all the children under five do not have birth certificates. So taken together, the CAA and the NRC represents an unprecedented assault on citizenship rights and makes Indian Muslims in particular and poorer people in general vulnerable to the state, to state persecution. Um, so far, CAA and NRC has met with widespread resistance all over India, but the CAA has not been repealed, neither has the NRC process been repudiated. So we have four special, uh, we have four esteemed panelists to help us unpack these complex strands and how they connect or how they diverge. Um, our first panelist is Nirja Gopal Jayal, who's a professor at the Center of the Study of Law and Governance at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. She's also the Centennial Professor in the Department of Gender Studies in, at London School of Economics. Her most recent publication is Reforming India, The Nation Today. Her book, Citizenship and Its Discontents, won the Association of Asian Studies Award in 2015. Elliot Prasi uh, Firman received his PhD in anthropology at Yale. He is currently an assistant professor at National University of Singapore. He has conducted long-term fieldwork in Myanmar and is working on a book project focusing on Burmese subaltern political thought, drawing on an extended ethnography of activism. He's studying Rohingya political subjectivity amidst dislocation and mass violence. Aman Vadud is a human rights lawyer based in Guwahati. He defends people accused of being illegal immigrants and those who are detained in various detention centers in Assam. Along with the organization he founded, the Justice and Liberty Initiative, he has secured the release of 350 detainees after the March 2020 Supreme Court judgment. Aman travels to various districts of Assam to educate people about the NRC, he has also been organizing training programs for lawyers who work before the Foreigners Tribunal. Shantani Chatterjee holds a PhD in anthropology from Columbia. Her research focuses on the questions of citizenship and belonging. Her book project examines the social worlds of the residents of Shivaji Nagar, also known as Bombay Gas Chamber. And prior to pursuing her doctoral studies, Chatterjee worked as a journalist for the Reuters the Associated Press and CNN. 
Um, thank you all for being here and uh, we'll just jump into the discussion. I actually wanted to start this conversation with uh, covering the trajectory of citizenship in India. So Nija, my first question is to you. Uh, in your expertise, which part of the CAA do you see as representing a departure and which are a continuation and even a culmination of the way in which the discourse around citizenship has evolved in post-colonial India? Uh, thanks, Ishani, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, that's an interesting question because the CAA 2019 is actually both. Uh, it's, it has the one central provision that is really important, and in that uh, central provision is both a departure as well as a culmination of uh, trends that have been unfolding over a few decades. So the departure is the obvious one. It's a departure from the original idea of Indian citizenship, which the constitution makers had adopted. Uh, that was that the primary mode of acquiring citizenship was birth, your soli, birth on the soil of the country, um, over that of your sanguinis, based on blood, race, descent, etc. And, and they chose it on the grounds that it was modern, civilized, enlightened, and democratic, all of these words used by the constitution makers. What the constitution also did in other parts, um, in, in, in part three, was to provide for universal equal citizenship to all, regardless of religion, race, gender, etc. Now, what this current amendment does is, it, it actually is limited to citizenship by naturalization. And it offers fast track citizenship to members of the following religious communities, Hindus, Sikhs, Christians, Buddhists, Jains, and Parsis, from three countries, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. The list of faiths excludes Muslims. It also excludes Sri Lanka and Myanmar as neighboring countries from which migrants do come. The official justification being that the new law will only cover persecuted religious minorities in three specific countries. But the law does not specify any requirement to prove religious persecution or indeed any procedure by which anyone's religious identity can be validated, right? So it, in this sense, it's a, not just a departure, but I'd say it's a foundational shift from the original idea of citizenship. First, it introduces religion as a criterion of citizenship into India's secular law. And the judiciary is yet to pronounce on this, but it seems to be violative of the constitution. And the second, it decisively jettisons something that was already being eroded, which is the principle of you solely, right? But like you said, um, it also represents the culmination of a long process in two senses. One is legal and the other is political. I'll, I'll make short shift of the legal one because it's complicated, but basically going back to the state of Assam and the political discontent there in the mid 1980s around the migration, in migration of many, many non-Assamese people, especially Bengalis, most of them migrants from Bangladesh. This led to the first amendment uh, of 1986, which created different categories of eligibility for citizenship based on the year in which people had come into, uh, come into India. It also did something very important. It inserted a new requirement uh, as regards citizenship by birth, so that after this amendment, only individuals born before July 1987 are citizens of India, regardless of parentage. In order to be a citizen by birth, anyone born between 1987 and 2003 must have one parent who is an Indian citizen. And then in 2003-04, this is again amend amended, and it makes ineligible for citizenship by birth a person who is born in India, but who has one parent who is an illegal migrant. This is the time when this term is introduced in the law at the time of their birth. And what does this signal? It signals covertly the religious identity, that is Muslim identity of many of the migrants from Bangladesh, right? And this is now finally in 2019, the CAA 2019 makes this exclusion no longer covered, but actually explicit by specifying religions. But that's the legal side of it. On the political side, this is without a doubt, the culmination of a, of a mobilization which gained ground in the 1990s with the mainstreaming of Hindu nationalist politics. And the CAA is very much a part of the hostile ecosystem for minorities 
that has been put in place in recent times, undermining the constitutional project of secular democracy. So if you look at it, the faith-based legal citizenship resonates perfectly with the idea of a majoritarian nation in which Hindus alone are natural citizens. So that's so, so it's a departure and it's a continuation and it's a culmination. It's all of those things simultaneously. Um, thank you very much for this uh, very insightful answer because, you know, many of us see the bigotry as a sudden uh, sort of occurrence of the rise of Hindutva, which to an extent it is, the, like you mentioned, the intensity at which it has come, but we forget the evolving sort of processual feature that has seeped into our uh, democratic institutions. Um, this, I also, since we were talking about this, the way in which this evolution also happened, I want to turn to the context of, of Burma. And um, Elliot, in, in, your, in your most recent work, you point to the fact that, you know, despite emerging from the same colonial empire, um, and today instituting policies that, that persecute their Muslim minority, India and Burma's citizenship regimes have had different trajectories. Uh, can you elaborate on some of the key differences, particularly in terms of uh, the relationship between the state and citizens? Sure, thank you. And thank you for allowing me to be part of this. Um, it's actually quite you know, serendipitous because I've been working on these uh, comparative um, you know, analyses between India and, and Myanmar, but I don't know the Indian case as well. So I'm gonna rely on the literature and, and you guys who know it better can correct me based on what's going on, on the ground. But basically what, like, what I think is going on is that you had a, um, Myanmar was part of um, India, as you say, until 1937. And for a long time, scholars kind of disavowed that connection, but then quite re more recently, um, because I, I think some of the scholarship on South Asia is so, is so good, there's been a lot of like application of sort of, you know, your, your Cone, your Dirks, your, your Partha Chatterjee, David Scott, on the sort of ethnographic state, uh, you know, Kavaraj, the way that, um, you know, governmentality, you know, in the Foucauldian sense, was applied to population groups and constructed them in legible ways that kind of created this relationship of mutual, mutual ratification between the state and the polity. So you knew who you were as a, a member of a population group vis-a-vis -vis the state. And that actually burnished your uh, a citizen's belonging. Um, but the state in, and, and so there was a sort of, um, ap, you know, kind of assimilation of this into the Burma case where people talk a lot about how ethnicity was reified. And I think often, a, uh, academics like the word reified a lot, makes them sound smart. Um, and it, it's a great word. But I think that the, the state projects were so different, um, both the colonial project and then the post-colonial ones. So um, while the ethnicities were kind of, were given names and, and they were symbolically represented, they weren't ascriptive. They didn't identify who people were on the ground very effectively. And so at where if the Indian case can be a case of you know interpolation where people feel called and beckoned as those categories and come to identify themselves with it. And then people, you know, horizontally, oh, oh you are also like that. You are also that yeah, category. Also that category. In Myanmar, um, Myanmar um, oops, I'm hearing myself twice. Um, in Myanmar, I think it's a little bit different in the sense that the categories never seem to match up all that well with what's going on, on the ground. And hence that creates, creates what I'm calling a sort of misinterpolation, a recognition that these categories don't represent us very well, and it gives people a kind of an opportunity to maneuver. And what I mean by that is that um, the state can't necessarily tell you who you are, and so there's all this sort of maneuverability, not just getting people getting to choose their ethnicity, but also the, the sort of categories themselves are really up for grabs. So people will tell me, um, so if I ask them what uh, ethnicity they are in Burmese, they'll say, well, I'm Hindu ethnicity, or I'm Muslim ethnicity, or I'm even Buddhist ethnicity, which shows a sort of pliability even in the categorization scheme it is still less nailed down than in other states. The second um, point here, and this actually goes back to, to Partha Chatterjee, is that he's talking about how people become legible, able to make claims as their population groups in that sort of uh, Foucauldian sense. And as such, they can maneuver in political society, um, basically, by pointing to the fact that they are, they matter as such. And I, what I see happening in, in Myanmar is a sort of zone outside of political society. Political society would actually be a, a really great thing for most people 
to exist in. And as a result, um, there's a sort of uh, radical um, inability for people to stabilize their claims to belonging in the nation. And as a result, there's a, a sort of, um, I would describe as a almost like an intense um, uh, need to perform one's belonging. And in those kind of contexts, uh, scapegoats and you know, constitutive outsides are easily identified. And I think what we see in the Rohingya case is uh, sort of a situation where, well, we don't necessarily know who we are in the in-group, but we at least know we're not those guys over there. And um, you know, while the, the state can never identify the ethnicities all that well, they at least could know people who looked you know, other, people who looked South Asian. And I think what's happening now is the Rohingya are, are being kind of scapegoated in, in that way. Um, that's, that's really, um, that's really fast. I mean, it's fascinating in the sense identity seems almost like fungible and like malleable in, 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 uh, uh, it probably when we come to the conversation around resistance and agency and a agent of work, uh, that people themselves do it, this would be a really interesting point to touch on. Um, but uh, thank you. And, and, and like you pointed out, um, it, it's just the different trajectories that they, that they took. And uh, it's very contextually based, the way in which India's and, political, uh, India's and Myanmar's political system has developed. And in talking about context, I also want to, I want to go to Aman's work in Assam. Uh, so Aman, you've been working with those incarcerated at detention centers for a while now. Um, can you tell us how the anti-CA movement is different in Assam from, from Northeast and for the from the rest of India? And what has happened in Assam in the last two years since the implementation of CA that you think deserves our attention? Oh, thank you so much for inviting me and giving this opportunity to speak and share screen with uh, Niraja, Niraja ma'am. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, the, the primary difference uh, between uh, the, the rest of the India and Assam and the Northeast with regard to CAA is that uh, in the rest of India, uh, CAA is primarily uh, objected by the people and the protest uh, went on uh, till COVID outbreak because uh, firstly of the violation of the basic constitutional tenets, uh, the basic structure of the constitution, which is secularism. The, uh, basically the constitutional idea and also uh, linking uh, CAA with NPR and NRC, uh, which uh, uh, the minister, home minister said that after CAA comes the NPR and then the NRC, uh, NRC the, the national, nationwide NRC, which already happened in Assam. So these were the reasons why the rest of India protested. Uh, in, uh, in the northeast of India, including Assam, the protest was basically because of uh, uh, the people here saw that this is an attack on the culture and the language uh, because there is a history of uh, migration into northeastern India. Not all migration has been illegal migrant, uh, illegal migration uh, post, uh, uh, you know, before independence, right from, you know, 1870s after the Rent Control Act came in, Bengal Rent Control Act in 1859. Uh, after that, since 1870s, the migration started. So mostly the migration was um, organic migration. Uh, and uh, after uh, independence, there were also migration when the, uh, uh, the Indo-Pakistan, um, the, uh, the Bangladesh was basically divided. Uh, East Pakistan was, uh, came into being, the Bangladesh came into being. Uh, there was also migration then. Uh, so people here think that there is an attack on culture and uh, language. Uh, but uh, this, was, this was tried to quell down by the government by bringing, uh, you know, excluding uh, IL, uh, the inner land permit area where uh, that, like Arunachal, Nagaland, and then uh, giving this uh, ILP, the inner land permit uh, to, to a state like Manipur and also excluding the six scheduled area, the tribal areas where, uh, you know, this, 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 this district has autonomy of their own excluding these districts from the, the ambit of the Citizenship Amendment Act. Uh, but uh, this, uh, you know, apart from this large area of the Assam uh, are still under uh, you know, CAA. So there is still a uh, protest going on. This is a big election issue. Regional parties have been formed uh, because of uh, uh, this Citizenship Amendment Act. Uh, on 10th of January, the act came into force, but it has not been 
implemented practically on the ground because rules have to be framed. Rules have not been framed till now. Uh, the, the government should have framed the rules and it, or, or, or sought for extension to the uh, committee, parliamentary committee, but nothing of that sort was done till uh, August last year where three month extension was sought. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, although the, the, the CA has come into, uh, you know, passed by the both the houses of the parliament, but it is not implemented on the ground yet. Uh, why, why, you know, it deserved attention uh, is uh, because uh, in Assam, there are districts where, like I said, it has been exempted, but the rest of the state still comes from the CAA. But as the chronology goes, as the government intends that after CAA will come the NPR and the NRC, NRC uh, NPR was supposed to come on, uh, start April 2020, but because of the pandemic, it got delayed. There are news that it will start again. NPR is the first stage of NRC, uh, NRC. Uh, that will become the base uh, for NRC. So if uh, a, a nationwide NRC is implemented, uh, then uh, one community, the Muslim community, will become more vulnerable than the other when it comes to uh, proving citizenship during the NRC process, if it all, at all uh, it is implemented. Although the prime minister has come on record and said that you know, we have no plan now, but you never know because uh, um, you know, this is, this is uh, a very politically uh, volatile issue. So people apprehend that NRC might be implemented. With regard to Assam, so when uh, uh, you know, CAA is implemented, uh, then what will happen, the foreigners tribunal, whether 100 foreigners tribunal in Assam, some in these districts, so it will only uh, try uh, the Muslim cases and not the other cases. So it will become more arbitrary space, right? It's already arbitrary. Foreigners tribunal is, is a very arbitrary space where randomly people are uh, declared as foreigner. But when CA is impl implemented, we fear that it will become more arbitrary considering all the Muslims will be tried uh, in, this, in this tribunal. Uh, except, apart from the, uh, the, the the autonomous district areas, so that is why I believe that uh, uh, you know it deserves more attention uh, from everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Aman. That's for your you know sort sort of close to the ground insight um, on Assam. Um, it's very and we'd probably talk a lot more about the foreigners' tribunal and what that is. And, um, and so far, I guess we've been seen, uh, seeing a lot of the sort of the persecutory logics of the state in our answer. So I also want to get in Shantani's input, her ethnographic insight uh, to basically discuss the experience of the people who see themselves as potential targets of this persecutory violence. Uh, so Shantani, something I found really powerful in your work um, when you've spoken about CA and NRC, that it has created an atmosphere of fear and paranoia and suspicion, even amongst those who have documentation. Um, so do you see this quality as something that is, a, you know, a newly emerging state citizenship relationship and state citizen relationship under Hindutva, uh, particularly amidst minorities, or is it part of a longer trajectory of persecuting religious minorities? Um, Shayantani, you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for the question. It's a great question. And as uh, uh, Professor Jayal also mentioned, um, it, it's, we have to see these uh, sort of techniques of governance as uh, having longer histories and continuity and that, that even though we may see moments of rupture had longer histories. So uh, for, during my fieldwork in Mumbai, um, in an informal settlement, uh, which was primarily Muslim, uh, many of my interlocutors spoke very anxiously of the specter of detention centers, along with mob lynchings uh, in, in the same breath, and how an atmosphere of uh, suspicion, paranoia, and fear engulfed their everyday lives. Uh, of course, at the national level, key players in the central government have been steadily involved in the circulation of um, hateful rhetoric, uh, exacerbated by, of course, how things multiply and circulate over social media. That said, these affective dimensions of governance and political life are obviously not novel. 
In fact, it may be even argued that they are a part, an integral part, in fact, of the lexicon of state power. So what interests me are the conditions that make such aspects of political life visible in particular moments to particular groups or communities of people. So what is noteworthy in this moment is the use of suspicion as a procedural tool to use, uh, for instance, the home minister's formulation that the NRC is just a process. So then what does it mean to embed suspicion within the process as a means of identifying who is or is not a citizen? It reveals the process itself then to be directed toward a predetermined outcome. Now, suspicion then functions both. I mean, how do we think about suspicion? It functions as um, through its proliferation, as well as an economy of gestures and like half truths, hints, allusions, accusations, and fallacies. Um, the suspicion, I think, mobilizes multiple forms of power such that when the object of suspicion is fixed by one instance, a host of other possible innuendos en enmesh the object. So the efficacy of suspicion as a mode of governance derives from this very elegant mechanism of self-proliferation. A hint suffices to ensnare the object of suspicion such, such that a meat eater becomes a cow killer who becomes an arsonist, who becomes an infiltrator. The elegance then also stems from its power to uh, implicate an entire population by a mere hint of suspecting a particular individual belonging to that group. So then something that is as, as uh, immaterial or seemingly immaterial as suspicion acquires the material weight, let's say, of a sword, figuratively. Um, now, um, for suspicions to persist among different communities is one thing, but using suspicion as a technique is another. And now let's say we think of citizenship as a mode of belonging as well as a regime of control that must be performed every day. Then if suspicion uh, has come to become a procedural tool where I can merely say, I suspect so-and-so is not a citizen. Uh, it, it, and, and it is directed toward a predetermined policy objective. Then it has also become one of the sources through which the state reinstates its power. So it's no longer that, the, uh, the, that citizenship as a mode of belonging whereby a political community may be formed from which the state uh, reinstates its power, which is the source of power for the state, but rather this other way in which uh, the state is reinstating its power. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. I mean, it seems like suspicion is like a new governmentality sort of tactic that the, that's been used by the state to control the population almost and has sort of a blanket effect on, on, on communities. And since the detention centers did come up um, uh, and uh, the fear of detention centers, the fear of being incarcerated in detention centers, I wanted to uh, again turn to Aman and because he's had firsthand uh, experience in talking about detention, in, in, in working with people incarcerated in detention centers. Um, under the category of doubtful citizens. Um, so what are the conditions of these centers, Aman? And, and how do people appeal to lawyers uh, if they can't afford them? And what are the future of these stateless people? What is Indi India's intention behind holding them in these uh, detention centers? Uh, firstly, uh, let me explain that there are two kinds of people who are detained in detention center. One is declared foreigners. Uh, or DF, which is declared, which, which the people declared foreigners by the foreigners tribunal. And the second is the convicted foreigners, which are actually the illegal migrants uh, who are people who came here or overstayed their visa and they are tried by the chief judicial magistrate or the subordinate judiciary. So there are two kinds of foreigners. The declared foreigners, you know, basically their their family members, they help them to file their appeal. But there are people who can't uh, afford a lawyer. So this legal service authority offer them legal uh, aid. 
the convicted foreigners because they don't have any relative here they are illegal migrants from uh, or they overstayed the visa uh, convicted by uh, the court in india uh, there is a problem uh, you know because they don't have relative they cannot uh, mostly uh, appeal before the higher um, judicial forums uh, with regard to the conditions so right now there are around 400 people in detention center and there are six uh, detention centers so these are centers are located inside the correctional homes or the prisons district jails uh, it started in 2009 uh, where you know three detention center were designated as uh, prisons were designated as detention centers so at some at one point of time there were around 1200 detainees and the conditions were very bad uh, inhuman it was crowded space it's still crowded uh, they have some one uh, one and a half feet to two feet area to sleep uh, very lace, uh, uh, you know, washroom areas. And then the most important thing is that they do not have right to parole. Uh, even if their family member dies, they're not able to come out. In the last three years alone, 30 people have died in detention. And very interestingly, uh, their body was handed over to the Indian family, which only means that these are, you know, these are Indian citizens. It is very peculiar situations where entire family is an Indian citizen, parents are Indian citizens, but one person is you know uh, declared a foreigner and, and detained in detention centers. Uh, they don't have right to parole. They don't have this minimum wage. Uh, uh, so if, if they are poor people and their family cannot give any kind of uh, you know provided any kind of money, so they they act, actually you know uh, inside in the prison they cannot buy anything. So they have to rely on the food which is provided by the detention uh, jail authorities, which is very poor. The quality of the food is very poor. Uh, and uh, 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 you know, with regard to what is the future of these stateless people, uh, I you know it's it's heartbreaking to say that I don't see uh, much hope because uh, firstly, the authorities want to declare more people as foreigners, uh, very arbitrary manner. You know, minor anomalies, your name, your age, uh, uh, or while deposition, you know, any minor contradiction in your deposition, your evidence can cost you citizenship. And the authorities want to declare more people as foreigners, strip more citizenship of Indian citizens. Declared foreigner, I'm telling you, are Indian citizens. In the last seven years, only four people have been deported. The main intention of detaining people was to deport to the country of origin. Now, when you declare Indian citizen as foreigner, you cannot deport to so-called country of origin because the country of origin is India. So the very mens rea, the very uh, intention of uh, 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 detaining people is not working. Only four people have been deported in the last four years uh, alone. India is not signatory to the two stateless convention and they do not recognize uh, statelessness uh, uh, and there is no deportation. Uh, Bangladesh will definitely not accept these people. And once you become stateless or declared as a foreigner, what happened is that you know citizenship is a right to have rights. You are denied of every possible right. Till July 2020, one lakh thirty-five thousand, which is one hundred thirty-eight thousand people, have been stripped of the citizenship. Now these people, their children, do not have any right. The number of stateless people will be much more. When government do not recognize the problem or want to declare more people as uh, as foreigner, so I, I really don't see much hope with the stateless people, except you know. Uh, they are bereft of any kind of right, any kind of protection under the Indian constitution. Uh, thanks, Aman. Um, I think both, you know, this is almost a terrifying stage-wise implementation of the of the policy as Shantani has spoken about, you know, going from suspicion and you are spoke, speaking about the reality of the detention centers. Um, and Elliot, in the context of Myanmar, the trajectory from law to violence has already been played out. Uh, so could you tell us a little about the contemporary factors that has caused uh, the disenfranchisement in, the in 1982 to the genocide in 2017? Yeah, it, it's a big and very important question. I hope I, I do it justice. So the 1982 law is often identified as this, um, this sort of watershed that, that really changed things, particularly for the Rohingya. Um, my colleague Nick Cheeseman in a paper in JC, um, Journal of Contemporary Asia, argues that it actually according to the law, as, as bad as it is, if that law was followed as it should have been, most Rohingya would have received citizenship. Um, and so it's actually the exception to the law that is the problem. Now my other colleague, Izzy Rhodes, um, she says the opposite. She says that may be true, but the law itself does a lot of violence too, that there are ways to follow it, to follow the sort of statutes that, um, 
that emerge from it that can allow justice to remain perpetually deferred. So if you follow things very slowly, if you don't, um, you know, as you know, don't re respect the spirit of the law, but merely the letter, you, people can remain in limbo literally forever. And so I think what's important to do is a sort of synthesis of those two positions. Um, I think they're both right. And the law is a weapon that can be used and is often fall, people, administrators fall back upon it and use it to reinforce their general um, racism. But it also can be uh, kind of exercised in the exception. And that's Cheeseman's point. You know, we aren't going to apply this at all. Um, but then there's the issue of where do we go from there to, to the violence? And this is a really more difficult question to uh, answer. Um, in, in the Q&A bucket I, box, I saw Jangai asked a question about the other ethnic minorities and how do they feel, which, and that leads to a, a broader question of how do most Myanmar people feel about the Rohingya. I think it's important to, to stress that uh, the generalized hatred discussed uh, for the Rohingya is very real but it's also directed at an object that they cannot identify. Um, and there's a great story, a colleague of mine, Rohingya colleague who actually managed to pass into what we might call normal middle-class society um, and became a, an, an, an NGO worker and was holding a training. And he said to a group of, you know, mostly, um, you know, Bama, but also other kind of ethnic minority people, you know, why are you so angry at a Rohingya? What do you th actually think they look like? And they, of course, um, rattle off certain uh, stereotypes, but really couldn't pick one out of a lineup. And he, of course, his big reveals, he was that person that you could I identify. Now that's not dispositive, of course, it's just a, an, an anecdote, but it does sort of show, and this is part because of the apartheid conditions that the Rohingya were kept in, in this little area on the border of, of Northern Rakhine State on the border with Bangladesh, how they were kept apart from the rest of the polity. But as such, they were kind of construed as the thin edge of a huge Muslim horde that was coming from the West. And this aspect, uh, at partially because of the lack of sophistication of the state, um, you have uh, where census, censuses aren't taken, and if they are, they're not um, circulated, you have demagogues and some of them coming from the state saying you know, there's huge increases of population, there's tons of Bengalis, the, the phrase they use for Rohingya, sneaking in every day, and that um, turns the this sort of miserable minority who's getting international attention and sympathy at, uh, allowing the bigger hordes to sneak in on, on their backs. Uh, and this is a sort of narrative that is continually um, propagated. Now, of course, uh, sorry, I'm going on a little bit long, but one, one more little point before I wrap this up is that um, it's hard or there, because of that issue of needing to perform belonging, you have these huge changes that are occurring in the political economy of Myanmar, where suddenly lots of resources are, are up for grabs and people are trying to demonstrate their ability to survive, I'm sorry, their ability to grasp those resources to survive. And the Rohingya are construed as uh, illegitimate interlopers who are claiming those resources. So I think that generates a lot of the sort of, um, sort of like libidinal hatred for, for these folks is that they are not only seeming as, as, uh, as a not belonging, but they are viewed as snatching the rights of the rest of the, of the people of Myanmar, where rights are construed more as opportunities than they are as entitlements. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it, it's, it almost seems like material, um, material conditions are compelling the sort of phantom hatred to just um, rise in, in, in this particular context. Um, we are a bit short on time and I really wanted to touch on um, the way in which people are resisting. Um, and we've been talking so much about uh, state persecution and especially in India, the resistance uh, against the CA and RC has been huge. So Nirja, I wanted to actually um, turn to you and we've been really inspired by the participation of women in these protest movements. Uh, so could you tell us why girls and women were particularly at the forefront of the anti-CA protests and would you link this to a longer history of women's participation in politics in India? Yeah, so I, I think the why question um, awaits its scholar, but uh, the fact 
remains that the, you know, the leadership of women, especially of Muslim women, including very elderly women, was absolutely stunning. Uh, one uh, small point before I get to the um, uh, to some possible explanations for this, which is that, yes, you're right. Um, there is a history of women's participation in politics. It's sort of on and off. Uh, it's not continuous. But there's also uh, the history of India's student movement. Uh, so if you remember the participation of young women and young men and others in the protests of 2012 after the Nirbhaya gang rape, right? Uh, the anti-CAA protests were actually preceded by two months of protests by students in Delhi. Uh, which actually, in a certain sense, segued into the citizenship protests. And, and so students remain very much a part of it, including women students. Now, th there's been a lot of speculation about why women. Like I said, there's no clear answer. Uh, but why did they, and especially why Muslim women participated in such large numbers in the protests? So one answer has been, uh, one speculation has been that women's participation was enabled by education and the experience of work. Um, another, that Muslim women had remained silent when Muslim men were being lynched, silent when triple talaq was enacted, and they had for a long time trusted that the mainstream political parties that claimed to represent them actually would and did represent them. But at this time, seeing the silence of the opposition parties, seeing the sort of manifest reluctance of these parties to take up cudgels on their behalf, and fearful for the future of their kids, they decided to uh, enter the protests themselves. Now, all of these explanations have some merit, but I would add one more. And I think that this law, unlike any other, was seen as posing an existential threat because it is an objective fact. And you, Ishani, alluded to this earlier that um, you know the low rates of registration, of civil registration, um, women more than any other group are threatened by the prospect of the NPR and the NRC. Uh, there are studies that show that women are more frequently excluded than men from civil registration, birth, death, marriage. And obviously there are you know, many reasons for this, poverty, limited education, a general lack of knowledge about the benefits of civil registration, which means that these things go unrecorded for women more than for men. Twice as many male deaths, for instance, are registered compared to female deaths, right? So also then marriage. Marriage leads women to migrate more than other groups, which makes them more vulnerable in terms of not having basic identification documents, sometimes regarding their name and mostly their age. This was most vividly seen in the case of the Assam NRC. When, when we read about women running helter-skelter from the village of their birth to the village where they had arrived after their marriage in search of documents testifying to their lineage. So uh, only Aman would be able to tell us as to whether, uh, you know, what the proportion of women in detention centers is in relation to that of men, but it is an important question and, and we don't know enough about it. I'll stop there, thanks. Uh, Aman, would you like to respond to Nirja's question actually about women? Uh, and uh, when, you know, one of the process of accusing people of being illegal migrants is putting D or doubtful before the voter list. So that voter list had uh, around 60 percent um, women. So there is a substantial number of women in detention centers, although the exact number is not known, but there's a substantial portion, maybe around 50 percent of the women. And I'd just like to add why, you know, women are more vulnerable. You know, most of the women in, in Assam, in rural Assam, they get married before uh, turning the minimum age to vote. Earlier it was 21, now it is 18 years of age. They don't go to school, their birth is not registered. And the only document, uh, the, the most important document actually is the voter list, the electoral roll. So when you do not vote in your parental home, because you are, you are married by then, and you go and vote at your matrimonial home, your name is registered in the voter list along with your husband. Because the electoral rule is the most important document you have, or might be the only document you have, that becomes almost useless. That does not help you because that voter list do not prove your link linkage with uh, your parents. So that is why women are more vulnerable. And you know, um, when a case, when a lawyer receives a case, when they find a case of a woman, even the first reaction is that you know this is a bad case. Uh, because there is no linkage. A man can prove their citizenship far more easier manner than a woman. Women are, there is an inherent gender bias here. But, you know, the, the gender bias is not, not recognized. You know, there should be a, you know, you know, separate procedure 
for for women considering their uh, you know you know inherent there is inherent gender bias which is not recognized and that is how more women are getting declared as foreigner than uh, than men uh, thanks a lot aman um, that's that's really important to know um Shantani, I also wanted to turn to you, uh, actually, but since we are talking, we, we did, we spoke about resistance and I wanted to ask you if you've seen any creative way in which people are trying to claim recognition or, you know, sort of surreptitious ways to circumvent these oppressive policies um, in your field side. Uh Yes, of course. Um, it, it, in the course of uh, my fieldwork, I did uh, see many ways in which people, in, in very small ways, I would have to caution. Uh, uh, I, I, I also want to say that um, uh, we have to sit with the discomfort also that sometimes it is not possible uh, to resist these, uh, these kind of frameworks. And when, um, despite that, when there are like sparks of uh, mobilizations or resistance that we see that, that it, 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 it is a matter of life and death. So for instance, the people that I worked with, for them to go, uh, their daily, many of them are daily laborers. So for them to um, go and do a dharna or participate in a morcha, for a one for one day is equivalent to losing their wage for that day, which means they don't eat the next day. And it, it's as, as uh, immediate and urgent as that. So I think we also have to sit with the discomfort of that uh, understanding that um, there may not always be uh, creative ways it, uh, to resist. And despite that, uh, we're seeing like uh, in, in starting in 2019, 2020, and, and this year as well, we've seen massive mobilizations from different uh, parts of the, uh, India's uh, citizenry. And that was kind of, uh, that was very inspiring uh, to, to, to see that. But it, it's also uh, a symptom, I think, of um, the different uh, groups that that are now uh, asking for or demanding more participation in their own governance, for instance, and um, uh, the 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 with enumerative projects like the NRC, for instance, which require uh, documentary evidence. Um, groups of people that that cannot furnish those documents, including women, Dalits, um, uh, you know, uh, and you know, would be affected adversely. And we, uh, uh, my colleague Natasha and I also kind of, uh, we edited this series uh, and, you know, our idea was to focus on the different kinds of solidarities that are possible in this, this moment, and also the limits to those solidarities. Uh, so for instance, like documents are a way for, for the, um, for, let's say for, for the queer and trans um, uh, group of people, um, documents could be a way to identify their dead names and their pasts. And this would be a, a very specific form of violence. So, so what I was what what I would say is that um, we have to we have to remember that imaginative and creative ways of resistance may have their limits as well. Uh, thanks. That's actually a very important point that everything from the way in which people have livelihoods, people are made more vulnerable and compelled to resist, and different people are not able to resist or resist in different ways. Um, it's, it's important to be cognizant of all these things when we think about agency itself. Um, I just wanted to remind the audience that the Q&A is open and you can post your questions. 
Um, and then I, I also want to turn to Elliot and, and ask, you know, what, how are the Rohingyas re responding to this uh, tragedy? How, how are they contending with it? How, are they, how is their community dealing with it, both inside and outside of Myanmar? Is, that's a, a huge question and, and one that I, I, I will address with the caveat that it's a very diverse community who, and that diversity is often elided in trying to recognize them as a group. Um, and I can get into that a little bit more later, but there's a sort of weirdness of insisting that people identify with the ethnonym that is getting them killed. Um, and so you have sort of international folks who are well-meaning saying, you must identify as Rohingya. And I, you know, the folks I work with in Cox's Bazaar are sometimes saying, I don't know if I want to identify with that. And this speaks back to the sort of issue of, um, you know, ascriptive identity versus more subscriptive version at the ontological level where people aren't necessarily are anything. They are a little bit more malleable. Now, it's a very delicate thing to say politically because you don't want to give nationalists and bigots sort of sucker, right, to say, look, the academic, he said that they're not real. I don't mean to say that at all, just to to pay attention to the, the difficulty in the politics of, of naming. And that of course relates to the politics of resistance or something I've been playing with recently is the politics of refusal, which of course comes from Audra Simpson and some other anthropologists. And I've tried to interpret it as a, a more indirect, longer standing evasion of some of the things that can get you killed where resistance is pretty darn binary and going against the sovereign sword. Refusal is a sort of maneuver with broader systems of governmentality. So um, like take a sort of, but to back to Partha Chatterjee, take a sort of mobilization and political society where uh, you go out and you burn up a bus or something. Now there's a sort of indexical, um, you know, calibration of that violence. You know, you're not going to kill a bunch of people, but you are going to burn a bus and that's going to say, look, pay attention to us. We are not to be trifled with. Now look what happened when the Rohingya, a, a splinter group, mostly of emigres coming from Saudi Arabia, trained in Pakistan, not particularly representative of the Rohingya. They formed this thing called ARSA. They attacked the border guard force and killed a couple uh, um, soldiers. And as a result, 700,000 people were driven out. 10,000 people were, were murdered in quite brutal fashion. Uh, you know, hundreds of villages raised. So there's no way that the classic resistance modality really works for, for the Rohingya. So they're kind of forced into this different kind of realm of what I might call refusal. But the issue there is that refusal is done in a lot of different ways. So elites, uh, and I don't mean that in just a derogatory way, like they, they're, but they're pursuing a project of sort of strategic essentialism as, as Spivak would say, and as Spivak has cautioned against in, in, in later work, because they're, they're trying to appeal towards this bigoted state, uh, uh, this state that says you have to have shown that you were in the country for hundreds and hundreds of years, you're not just Bengalis. Um, but the problem is this insists that people who might not identify with this project I, identify with it in, in ways that might get them killed. So you have this really fascinating, and I, I hesitate to even use that word because it, it's too, it, it doesn't you know, do justice to the, the weight of this, but you have people kind of deciding how they're going to arrange their commitments to their kin and broader networks who are being persecuted and killed while also trying to make sure they don't, don't die and watching, uh, like watching the, what we might call the ethnogenetic forces under these particular conditions is, is heartbreaking and, and a terrible thing to have to behold. And it throws into relief the sort of, um, discussions of, of resistance. And, and, and I think dovetails nicely with Shantani's point about these things are, are life and death. Yeah. Um, so since w for the lack of time, um, I actually wanted to ask about the future of citizenship and, and I wanted to turn to Professor Jayal um, because uh, Nirja, your book is hailed as a biography of Indian ideas of citizenship. So I wanted to ask you, what, how do you see the future of Indian citizenship and which of these tendencies are likely to win out? Um, you know, we could see this, uh, I'm, we could look at this question in terms of the politics of the day or uh, which some of the questions uh, in the Q&A have, uh, I think Tariq's question is actually um, uh, 
in a sense, asking the same thing. Or we could look at it in terms of deeper ideological tendencies. And I would, I think the, the two have different answers. So if we take partisan politics, which clearly was the driver for the amendment in the first place, uh, we could notice one silver lining, uh, maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm not of an optimistic temperament personally, but, uh, but it's possible to think that, you know, the anti-CA protests have accomplished one thing, that the rules have not been notified. Of course, the extension has, I think, twice already been sought from Parliament. And the pandemic has been used as an excuse for not having formulated the rules already. But many people believe, like I said, maybe over optimistically, that they have decided to let the amendment remain on the statute books without repealing it, but also not pursuing this project uh, in, uh, to the extent and, and so far as it is not politically convenient or expedient to do so. So, for instance, currently, the, uh, I mean, in recent um, uh, sort of political speeches in Assam, uh, Aman would, uh, you know, would be able to vouch for this or not, but uh, the uh, the NRC has not, the CA and the NRC have not been mentioned lately. Um, so that, and, you know, Assam is heading into elections in a few months. But this could at best be, I think, this, uh, the temporary defeat of a really bad initiative. Yeah. So my bigger worry would be about the deeper ideological tendencies that would surely, or at least likely persist even if the law is temporarily placed in cold storage. And on this front, it seems to me that the exclusionary tendency would be the one that would win out, or that seems to be winning out. But of course, much would depend on how deeply embedded majoritarian sentiment is, how deep and wide um, the poison of toxic polarization has spread and how deeply entrenched it is. So then one might ask, is there scope for retrieval? Many of us in increasingly frequent moments of deep despondency, feel that we've reached a point of no return. If that is true, then we would, in practice, if not yet in law, uh, be moving towards or have moved towards a Hindu nation state with a hierarchy of graded citizenship, graded according to faith, in which only Hindus would enjoy first class citizenship. So, uh, so that's the, the political, uh, the, the answer about the politics of the day, but also the deeper ideological tendencies about which I'm less optimistic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, of course, I can, I can go on and ask um, follow up questions, but I think uh, there are a lot of questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to just open it up to the audience. Um, so the first question is to Elliot. Uh, it's speaking uh, to what uh, Dr. Freeman said regarding the need to perform belonging. Can the panelists speak to how different laws codify their needs for citizens to constantly perform and prove belonging? Um, like it's, I, sorry, I, it, the uh, question is open to all the panelists. Like the UAPA or the sedition in India is used to regulate dissent and call uh, label citizens as anti-national from Aisha. So uh, who would like to answer Aisha's question? I think this one is a little bit less for me than, than for um, from our colleagues talking about uh, India. Or... Yeah, Shayanti, would you, would you like to answer this question? Because it's also talking about performance of citizenship. Sorry, I was I on mute while <laughs> talking. Uh, would you like, Shayantri, would you like to answer the question? Yes. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, um, it to me it would seem that uh, the the different ways in which uh, you're being the 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 different ways in which you're asked to uh, perform citizenship also depend on who you are and how what your position in this uh, reputative like uh, hierarchy of citizenship is uh, so so 
uh, so of course, it's the the more vulnerable you are to uh, in that hierarchy, the more vulnerable you are to uh, sort of uh, holding yourself back. But what I I would also say that we are seeing from from you know the the recent events. Uh, um, uh, of protests and, and mass mobil mobilizations, uh, we are seeing that you, you can be pushed only so much thus far. And, and then uh, is it, how, how, how is it possible to, to sort of uh, regulate dissent? How much can you regulate dissent? That said, uh, there are uh, instances like uh, recently um, a comedian being arrested, for instance, uh, for for a joke that he did not make, that he was about to, that 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 he may have made, or somebody just uh, accused him of making. Uh, so you are being uh, you're being arrested for something you didn't do that you could have done. So there there is. There are, I think, both these uh, um, moments, and that's that's an interesting sort of mix, where of course there is uh, a huge crackdown on dissent, and even something uh, like I said, as as sort of uh, um, like the comedian being uh, arrested, um, but there's also a outpouring of uh, mass mobilization. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Okay, the next question is for uh, Dr. Nirija and Aman Vadud. Uh, what role do you think the, vica the vicarious experiences by the population in the rest of India, mainly through media reports, of the cumbersome administrative procedures of Assam NRC play in persuading them actively to oppose the NPR NRC under the CAA? This is for uh, Aman and uh, Niricha. Aman, why don't you go first? Uh, well, I think till now, uh, what has happened in the rest of India, you know, the peaceful protest uh, uh, that has actually, uh, I, I think, you know, stopped uh, the implementation of the nationwide NRC. Uh, so that is that is what I think. I think briefly stating that you know. Uh, the peaceful protest should go on, uh, and that is the only way to only way to stop this uh, exclusionary process of scrutinization of the citizenship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, if the question is asking, um, as I think it is, that you know the experiences in Assam have contributed to uh, people in the rest of India being fearful. Uh, of the NRC. Uh, I think that's, that's very valid. Uh, we know of about, I think, 30 odd suicides, not only in Assam, but also in Bengal that have occurred for, you know, because precisely because of this fear that you might be undocumented. Uh, and one hears stories about the fear and paranoia that Shantani spoke about so eloquently. We've seen uh, and heard stories of this all the time from North India and in, in many parts of North India, not just Delhi. Uh, so clearly that has played a role in heightening fears, especially the exclusions uh, in large numbers. Uh, what, I, what one doesn't know, however, is whether uh, there is widespread awareness of the fact that uh, not just large numbers of Muslims, but even large numbers of Hindus, uh, as we understand, were left out of the Assam NRC. Uh, the figures one has read is that 1.2 million Hindus and 700,000 Muslims. I don't know if that's correct, but that's what I read. Um, and, and one doesn't know if that has made other people in other parts of India, non-Muslims also fearful, uh, but certainly the poor uh, who are generally very much less documented, oftentimes undocumented, uh, would have reason to fear that. And uh, which, which actually reminds one of, of the uh, possibility pointed out uh, in, uh, an, in an older work, uh, Kamal Sadiq's book, Paper Citizens, uh, you know, that, that, that illegal, actually illegal immigrants are likely to be better documented, having acquired documents through what he calls uh, networks of complicity and networks of profit, 
uh, uh, while uh, uh, while Indians who have you know Indian citizens who have uh, who have lived in this country and whose ancestors have lived in this country for generations uh, upon generation uh, may not actually be documented at all. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So I, I, I'm sure that this has played some part in um, in fueling the protest. I can just yeah. add. If I can just add, uh, you know, the deaths, uh, the separation of the family, the detention centers, uh, separation of children from the mothers. So these were one of the one of the stories that had been, you know, repeatedly being stated in those, uh, you know, women who participated in this in this protest, either in Shahinbagh or all the smaller Shahinbagh across the Sam. So whenever a reporter asked them that why are you protesting, you know, why are you on the street in these winter nights, and uh, the the most common answer that I I heard uh, is that you know they don't want to end up in detention center, uh, and their fear is not actually unfounded. You know, people in Assam have actually you know, like in the three years, last three years, 30 people have died in detention centers. There were lots of stories like Momiran Nessa, Minara Begum. They were detained in detention center for around nine years, uh, separated from their families. Uh, Minara Begum, when she was detained, uh, the day she was detained, her, her, her daughter was only 15 days old. Uh, she was in detention center for 10 years. There was indefinite detention before Harshmandar went to Honorable Supreme Court. Supreme Court put a cap on detention of three years. Then we went to the Supreme Court to reduce it, the Supreme Court reduced it to two years. So now you have to be in detention center for at least two years. So I think, you know, uh, th these stories have actually, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, increased the, 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 the protest all over the country. And apart from that, you know, it's not about only documents, you know, how document is, uh, you know, seen by the courts, you know, there is a, uh, there is a perception, you know, of uh, 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 non-citizenship. You know, in, in a criminal jurisprudence, uh, the basic principle is uh, uh, a presumption of uh, innocence. Here, there is a presumption of guilt. You know, the moment you go to the court or you are accused of being a foreigner, the, 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 the forum which, uh, you know, try these cases, which heard these cases, they presume that you are guilt. You are not an Indian citizen. So they have seen how Indian citizens, it's not about illegal migrants, how Indian citizens have been declared uh, uh, as foreigners. Also. Uh, some stories like uh, Ajmal Hawk, Muhammad Sanaullah, both of them were retired uh, Indian Army officer. Sanaullah was in detention center. Uh, he served the Indian Army for, uh, for 10 long years. And the day he was accused of being foreigner, the, when his uh, so-called you know, confessional statement was uh, forged, that day he was in Manipur for, uh, on duty for a counter -insurgency, insurgency program called Hifaza, which means security. So, th so when he was securing India from, you know, uh, alien enemy, the border, some border police was accusing him of being an illegal migrant. Now, when an army officer can be declared as a foreigner, stripped of citizenship, and detained in detention centers, are we really safe? I think these experiences have actually, you know, alarmed the rest of the people, uh, re rest of the India. That you know, even if the similar process is replicated across the country, uh, they are also not not safe. Can I just add um, an application of the question to the Myanmar context? So um, many of you have likely heard on, you know, John Oliver's show or 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 on from Reuters articles that Facebook caused genocide in, in Myanmar. And I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. But but it the circulation of the um, violence against Rohingyas has had some really important effects. Uh, that, that should be addressed. So the issue, the first problem with that is that the military caused the genocide and the military still runs the Myanmar state. And while Aung San Suu Kyi has tried very hard to be as, uh, because I think she shares the basic values of the military, unfortunately, has to, you know, tried to basically create a, a forge a bond between them. The military still is the, you know, operates the, the organization of violence and they were the ones who did this. Now what social media did, did do was that it allowed um, uh, people to actually have a conversation about who was in in their in their country who belongs now the sort of received wisdom is that social media um, penetrated gullible and unsophisticated viewers or listeners or however we call them consumers and and hoodwinked them and as you can see there's a whole lot of Com, uh, connection or application to the QAnon stuff going on in, in your country right, right now. Um, 
But I think that at least in Myanmar, there's something else going on, which isn't that they're just hoodwinked, but rather um, because Myanmar's brutalized public sphere has been dominated by the military for so long, actual people weren't allowed to participate in these sort of conversations. And now political entrepreneurs are circulating narratives about who belongs and who doesn't, and everyone gets to participate, sometimes literally participating by producing their own Facebook posts that kind of declares who should be in and who should who should not. And I think that in the sort of, you know, Irvin Goffman sense that when we, you know, you, you animate a text, you, you sing the national anthem, uh, here the, um, the Myanmar people are kind of writing the national anthem. They're authoring it, they're principling it. And there's a sort of affective commitment or affective investment in that project that is different than just a consumer or recipient of this information. And that's what I think so, um, powerful about the uh, the social media aspect is that, you know, everyone in Myanmar has a smartphone and many, most people are participating in these conversations. They're not always necessarily bigoted, but they are certainly um, often about drawing distinctions between who a real Myanmar person is and who isn't. Uh, thanks for that. So we have got several questions on the global context and perhaps uh, all the speakers can address this. Um, we have, uh, to what extent are the policies a part of global Islamophobia in the wake of the war on terror? And to what extent are these policies a byproduct of a global increase in right-wing nationalism? Finally, in what ways are international coalitions being formed to challenge and implement um, practices of these forms of exclusionary um, legislation? So. Um, Elliot, would you like to go first? Yeah, so it's actually um, kind of dovetails with my last point is that this sort of broader uh, context of ratification, uh, if you can call it that, um, uh, or that's a perhaps a, a bad phrase, but let me back up and say that these narratives that are being generated at the grassroots find um, sort of common travelers, fellow travelers with um, with right-wing Islamophobes across the country, I'm sorry, across the world. My, my colleague, Matt Schistler, has a, a really interesting article on these connections between these um, Kind of bigots around the world and it um often people will say to me well you know what happened to your country L look at what uh, you guys were bombed and they are they're all like this and so there's a sort of kind of um they're trying to create a a global common ground um that a right-wing common ground uh, that kind of everyone can agree uh, about the general qualities of of those people and i think they end up reinforcing each other's messages Um, Nirja, would you like to respond to this also in the context of uh, India? And yeah. I actually I can't see the entire. I can't. I just I can see one uh, sort of two bits of the question. Is it the one that says why are only Muslim minorities being targeted in both these countries? Uh, it is. It's uh, basically a lot of questions have come regarding. Okay. Okay, so you merge them, right? Okay. So to the extent that I got ah okay, um, you put it in the box. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, of course, it is a, a feature of right-wing nationalism uh, and of populist right-wing nationalisms that uh, you know that they foster uh, a, a sort of, if not xenophobia, then certainly a sense of uh, who belongs and who doesn't, who's an insider and who's an outsider, uh, in the way in which they constitute the idea of the people, uh, and that that always entails some kind of an in-group. It could be racial, it could be religious, it could be whatever else it is. So, uh, but in India, I think it's not just that. I don't think it's simply the global war on terror and global Islamophobia, though uh, there might be a sort of a, a happy coincidence for some um, in that. I think it's also the um, resurrection of uh, an old fault line, which uh, we presumed, the scars that we presumed had been healed after the partition and in the in the decades immediately after, but I think the um, uh, sort of a certain kind of Hindu nationalist mobilization has uh, has a political mobilization has has brought those uh, has made those scars as it were 
open again, open those wounds again. And, and it is so, in a certain sense, it is as the champions of that viewpoint put it themselves, it is the unfinished business of the partition. So I think it is very specific uh, domestic roots as well. The uh, external uh, thing might be a coincidence. It might also be something that can be conveniently leveraged politically uh, in the international sphere. But, uh, but primarily, I think it's wellsprings are domestic. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question uh, that asks, um, are Muslims the only ones likely to suffer under the CA, NRC, or are other minorities also going to suffer under this new law? And I think, uh, Shantani, uh, your series on Polar actually talks a bit about this. I was wondering if you could. Yeah. Um, yes, as I kind of briefly mentioned earlier also that um, the, uh, the, the demand of, of documents affects those parts uh, of the population of the citizenry that um, are likely to not have access to documents. As such, uh, we have not been uh, a documentary kind of uh, society for very long. It's, it's now that we have uh, sort of, you know, a, a number of enumerative projects that uh, side by side uh, are trying to uh, kind of, uh, uh, identify populations as citizens or uh, put populations within a citizenship regime, not, not necessarily uh, granting them citizenship. But uh, so, so the point is that, that groups that are, have always, um, uh, you know, perhaps lived, uh, you know, have been living in India for generations, uh, don't have documents, don't have birth certificates, don't have, uh, you know, documents to prove domicile. Um, uh, you know, voters IDs have been uh, variously acceptable as documents of uh, proof, but also not in different places. So it's unclear. And of course, there are groups, um, uh, uh, you know, Dalits would uh, figure in that group um, of, of uh, you know, large number of people who do not have documents that can prove domicile. Um, women, as Aman uh, mentioned, uh, would be one of the groups as well. So it is, it's, it's very clear that it is not uh, only Muslims, but of course, as also we've been talking about, uh, everyone's been mentioning uh, the, this narrative fits the global uh, narrative of is Islamophobia, for sure. It does fit that narrative. So it is easy to sell that to a, a larger audience, uh, as it were. But um, that's not to say that there, there aren't groups within India which are uh, as badly affected. Uh, differentially, but of course, they, they are also badly affected. Um, we have another question uh, for Professor Jayal. Uh, what is the future for the development of social rights of citizenship in the current context? Sanjeevani Lokhande. Yeah, I would come to that, but I think Aman wanted to say something on the previous question. He's put it in the box, so let him go first. Yes, please do. Yeah, so I, I want to give a more uh, practical answer uh, with regard to if only Muslims will be, uh, you know, will suffer under this process. So firstly, with regard to Assam, uh, the CAA will definitely protect the people who have been excluded from the NRC, uh, the Bengali Hindus, the, the non-Muslims. But you know, you'll have to, although the rules are not framed, but there were news that you'll have to give an affidavit that you are persecuted community from Bangladesh or either of the country, in Assam, particularly Bangladesh. So uh, the people who have applied for the NRC, uh, they have given document of pre-1971. And in all probability, uh, the Bengali Hindu friends I have, I know them who have been excluded. Of course, they are Indian citizens. Now they will have to tell that, you know, we are not Indian citizens. Give us citizenship under the Citizenship Amendment Act. You are getting citizenship at the cost of your dignity, right? You are claiming that you are not a citizen of India, despite having your, all your papers. With regard to the rest of India, if ever uh, citizenship uh, NRC is implemented, 
the uh, the legal structure is already there the citizenship rule 20, 2003 it says that uh, a junior level executive officer can accuse any person uh, you know ask any person to prove citizenship now that person you know india does not only have this communalism you know it has various sorts of um, social problems there's casteism there's regionalism linguistic problem uh, personal enmity so if that junior level executive officer you know have enmity with any person or do not like any person he can ask any person to prove their citizenship right you might as a non muslim you might prove your citizenship what do you say i mean if you do not have document what do you say that i came from this three country you completely erase your existence in india what do you do and then what does it it weaponize your uh, you know fellow citizens to to accuse you to you know sort of complain file an objection against you in assam uh, one lakh you know around th three lakhs objection were filed there were objections filed against my five year old nephew entire family in the nrc but my five year old nephew apparently should not be in the nrc my 17 year old cousin for whom my mother had to go and you know um, depose as a witness all people my friends who flew down from calcutta from other parts of the country to attain this objection hearing because there are an objection against them so you you can weaponize your fellow citizen to file an objection against you do you really think that his objection will only be against the muslims definitely not so if this this regime comes this nrc regime comes everyone will suffer of course the muslims might suffer more than other but there is no doubt that everyone will suffer thank you so much aman that's very true um, Nature, Should I return, yeah, I'll return to the question of um, Sanjeevan, Sanjeevani Lokhante's question. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the, you see, if you look at it in terms of two categories of people, one, the so-called doubtful people, the ones that Aman was just speaking about, people who somebody comes along, somebody who's on the list comes along and says, this person is doubtful. And then that person then has to go through this entire foreigners tribunals, uh, and, you know, all the way up to the courts and whatever the process is, it would slowly move up, if at all. Uh, that person will definitely be not just disenfranchised, but will not have any other social rights at all. Um, they're minimal enough and pitiful enough in any case, but that person would not be entitled to any, even of the most minimal social rights, whether it's access to the public distribution system or anything else, that person would not have. Uh, others... Uh, who would, you know, the undocumented, large numbers of undocumented poor that we are speaking about, uh, that Shantani also spoke about a little while ago, uh, the undocumented poor, who are the undocumented poor? Uh, they're not just Muslims, they're also Dalits and Adivasis, and perhaps some others. But all of these people are going to be, uh, are going to suffer a, 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 a deprivation of their social rights as well. Because as it is, we've seen, in, in the past few years, we've seen people unable to get healthcare, unable to get food simply because the Aadhaar card was not seeded with the relevant other card, right? Uh, people have died for, out of hunger and, and medical neglect because of these cards not being seeded with each other. Um, think of how much worse it could be if you're undocumented. You cannot prove your, your, your existence as a legal juridical person and uh, as, a, as a moral entity, you don't have any uh, recognition any, anyway. So basically, you're going to be deprived of every right, including social rights, political and civil rights, but also social rights. Uh, and uh, so the, the future, of, therefore, for social rights is very bleak. I mean, I, let me put it this way. Um, the poor already uh, may be legally, formally citizens, but they do not have substantive citizenship, right? Um, with this, with the NRC, and if they are declared undocumented and therefore doubtful and therefore foreigners or whatever, uh, they would lack, they would not only be what they currently are substantively second class citizens, they would also be uh, formally, legally dubious citizens or not citizens at all. Therefore, their entitlements would obviously be even less than they are. Thanks. Um. Okay, there's a question for Dr. Jayal and Dr. Chatterjee. Uh, in a broad sense, in a in a broader sense, how can we think about the implications for the idea of the nation state when we see, in the case of India, the state expanding by making its presence felt through citizenship while attempting to contract in the way using you know religion and suspicion, and 
relatedly, perhaps, is some form of right-wing nationalism critical to this process by Nandini De. I can paste it in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Should I, um, I, I can attempt an answer um, to this. It's a, I mean, I, I think it's, this is a very, it's not, just a, it's not just a question, it's actually a very insightful comment. Uh, and it's a comment that bears thinking about. Uh, I mean, I think right-wing nationalism is critical to the process one way or the other. Um, uh, it's interesting that uh, Nandini Day mentions, um, uh, uh, you know, mentions the expansion of the state, There's the expansion of the state and making its presence felt not just through citizenship, but in many other ways, including surveillance. Uh, but also remember in the Indian case, there's also the, um, uh, the increasing power of the vigilantes. We've seen this yesterday in Delhi, today in Delhi, we've seen it uh, for many years now. So the, the power of the vigilantes supplements and complements the power of the state and the expansion of the state. Uh, I, I think at no other time in our history, including in the emergency, have we seen such a close connection between the, uh, you know, between the state and these other complementary forces that that supplement it and 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 do its work so that's there's that but but certainly right-wing nationalism is critical to it because right-wing nationalism uh, it's 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 a central feature of right-wing nationalism uh, to define who belongs and who doesn't belong so uh, to that extent certainly but it's a very insightful comment thank you and to add to uh, professor jayal um, I, I i just want to say that i i also think it's a very insightful question and uh, I've been thinking about um, precisely something along these lines uh, as I kind of try to conceptualize uh, what suspicion does, how, how the modality of suspicion works and to think of the state, state's power expanding uh, not spatially alone but also temporarily so in the mode of anticipation and, and fear in the future, so what might happen to uh, a citizen in the future is, is, is a different modality. It's, it's uh, uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, governance of, of the affective future of a citizen is also a way in which the state might expand itself. So it's not just in the present, but also this fear of either, uh, you know, the threat of, of um, you know, the state uh, or, or, you know, being arrested for something or the other uh, on suspicion of being, uh, not being a citizen or in the form of uh, redistributive uh, uh, policies as well. The fulfillment of the, the of uh, the fulfillment function of, of the government, like uh, what, I, what I kind of conceive of as the Anewala form of governance, uh, both in the sense of NRC Anewala hai, but also in the sense of uh, electricity Anewala hai, the, the coming uh, of the government, the arrival of the government. Um, yeah. So thank you for that question. Yeah, those were really great answers. Um, Elliot, I think we have uh, time for one last question. Uh, and there's a question that asks, how, are, how is the process similar and different from Myanmar's NBC process with the Rohingyas? Great, yeah. Um, so one of the problems here, and, and uh, I can't quite compare it to, or I, I can't, make claims to understand the Indian context all that well. But um, the problem in the Myanmar case is that citizenship doesn't mean anything unless it comes with uh, a ratification or, or recognition of the holder of that citizenship as belonging to one of these indigenous groups. So there's this really terrible catch-22 for the Rohingya who are, are given the opportunity to admit right, uh, their, their uh, Bengaliness in exchange for which they will receive the coveted pink card that declares they are a citizen. But then they uh, are told, um, actually, that pink card 
keeps you immured in your in your village it's and as such it's not worth the the you know the price it's it's printed on so um that's why the i, I kind of talked about it earlier about how you know rohingya elites understandably are trying to not just get citizenship but get recognition as as an indigenous group what's called in burmese called Danyanta. um and so for a lot of kind of liberals, uh, especially from the outside, giving advice are saying, well, just give them all citizenship, that there's an easy solution to this, not realizing that that form of recognition is a degraded one that it essentially, and, and this kind of points to Professor Jael's point earlier about this sort of um, hierarchical uh, graded citizenship that might be coming in, to India, the way that at least for, for Muslim um, citizens or, or not of, of Myanmar, they would be marked with this, uh, this stain of, of not quite belonging, even if they have the, the literal uh, piece of paper. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I guess we are running out of, we have run out of time. So I just wanted to conclude by saying that today we have heard some of the horrifying details of state persecution through the medium of citizenship laws in Burma and in India. We've seen how the assault stretches beyond Muslims and affects women and even more severely than they affect men. We have heard also heard the ways in which people are trying to resist this persecution and learn the limits of that resistance. And I really want to thank the panelists for all the perspective they had to offer and for the generative conversation that we had today. So thank you everyone for coming and being a part of this discussion. Thank you. And thank, thank you for moderating it so well. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>